mindful of our panelists' time as well as those that are working um, to keep this as close to the hour as possible. So I want to say to each and every one of you, I am Shay Lewis Cisco. I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. I am just super excited that you all have agreed to be a part of this panelist in this discussion as my um, Mr. Mark Berry, who is the Director of Student Engagement and Development, has actually put together this panel and of course he tasked me with the responsibility of gathering the panelists and moderating today's discussion so Mr. Mark Berry I would like to say thank you to you and Dr. Coppersmith who is the uh, president of Chesapeake College and before we get into introductions for our panelists at this time I would like to give Dr. Coppersmith the opportunity to say a few words. Well, first of all, Shay, thank you to you and to Mark for putting this on. It's uh, certainly a timely uh, activity. It's uh, This is going to be a critical election. Uh, as a historian, I, I know a little bit about the, uh, the politics and uh, elections in our democracy, and uh, I think you put this year up with some of the big years in our historical past uh, in which uh, having an election during difficult times is certainly a challenge, but nonetheless must happen. Uh, uh, both the elections of 1860 and 1864 in particular happened under extremely difficult circumstances, but they did happen. And uh, the 1864 election, for example, the, most of the Union Army was furloughed to go home to vote uh, in the middle of the Civil War. And so this country has uh, managed elections during difficult times. Uh, they've done it well with the results that were not questioned, or at least uh, challenged beyond uh, kind of the, the, the kind of routine challenges you get with elections. But that being said, I'm very uh, pleased and uh, honored to have our senators and uh, potentially our representatives with us today uh, and for their uh, participation in our process as our local leaders. Uh, they're of course very visible and they're very vital to the, uh, the representation of the Eastern Shore at our state level of government. So thank you for all for participating today. We appreciate your support of Chesapeake College and uh, thank you for the chance to say a few words. Thank you so much, Dr. Coppersmith, for joining us today. Um, uh, good morning, Delegate. Um, and Senator Johnny Maltz, thank you for joining us. And I guess we want to go right ahead into this morning's uh, discussion. So we'll start with introductions. And I'm actually going to go down the list um, that is on uh, the advertisement. So we'll actually start with Ms. Gwendolyn Dales. She is the Director of the Board of Elections in Dorchester County. Hi, good morning. Um, yes, Dorchester County Board of Elections, and we're located in the county office building in Dorchester. I'm um, Ms. Uh, Gwendolyn Dells. We have Ms. Brittany Phillips, if you would introduce yourself at this time. Hi, good morning. It's Brittany Phillips. I work in the election office with the officials. I do most of the voter registration and absentee applications, vote by mail information and things like that. So hopefully I'll be of some help today. Thank you so much, Ms. Brittany. And at this time, Senator Johnny Moss. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you. Uh, you unnecessarily just gave me a promotion because I'm the delegate. We have our senators on this panel. So that's okay. uh, no disrespect, Senator Eckert. Thank you for the, uh, for the promotion. <laughs> but uh, my name is Johnny Mounts. Uh, I'm in my uh, second term for the Maryland House of Delegates. Uh, I live in the city life village. I grew up in the New Shore, uh, and I run my family's business there. Uh, I run a family restaurant. I serve on the restaurant. OK, is anyone else having um, difficulties kind of hearing? Couldn't hear him. No, you were off mute. You, your, your sound just wasn't, it did not come through as clear. I had this problem with a call earlier this morning. Can everybody hear me now? No, nah, it's still a little uh, difficult. I'm going to tune off. I'll be back momentarily and catch you at mid in, in, in a couple minutes. I apologize. Not a problem. Thank you. Um, Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes. Good morning, everyone. I am Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes. Also, I serve as the Speaker Pro Tem for the Maryland House of Delegates. 
and I represent District 37A, which is a portion of Wicomico and Dorchester County. I've been in the legislature now. Um, this is, again, my second term as well. Delegate Johnny Mouse and I came in at the same time. And it's great to be here today and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Delegate uh, Sharice Sample Hughes. At this time, Senator Addie Ecker. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you all for putting this together. I think voting is very important. As Dr. Coppersmith said, it's essential this year in these difficult circumstances, but now is the time to really get more engagement and get involved. I represent District 37, which is all of Talbot, all uh, a third of Caroline, all of Dorchester, and one half of White. Comico County. I've been in the legislature since I was elected in 1994, spent 20 years in the House of Delegates, and now I'm in the Senate. And it's been an honor and a privilege to serve the citizens of the Midshore. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Addie Eckert. And at this time, Councilwoman, City Councilwoman Doncella Wilson. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Shay stated, I'm Don Sella Wilson. I actually represent um, the town of Denton, Maryland. So excited to be here and I'm grateful for the invitation. Thank you so much. And now, City Councilman um, Steve Rideout. Hi, Steve Rideout from Cambridge. Uh, I'm a one term, uh, one and only term uh, city commissioner. My term will end in January. Um, and uh, was elected in 2016, and I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Steve, and our last panelist, uh, uh, Councilman uh, Oliver T uh, Elson Tolliver. All right, so, so, so I've heard I've heard it all. I'm Reverend Ellsworth Tolliver. I'm the, I'm a council person in Chestertown, Maryland, representing the third ward the most diverse ward in Chestertown, uh, mm -hmm. otherwise known as the hotbed of activity. And I'm, <laughs> honored, I'm honored to be on, on this panel um, with this great group of, of individuals and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, I want to say thank you all to our panelists. I mean, when Mark actually tasked me with this assignment to put the panelists together for today's discussion, I could not have thought of the better, any better individuals to actually serve on this panel today. Um, we have a variety. We have county, city, um, senators, delegates, and of course, we cannot forget about the Board of Elections who have a tremendous part in the voting process and in the working of what we are going to be dealing with this election year. So. Before we actually get started, did anyone have any questions in terms of the questions that were sent to you all um, before we get into the questions? This is a student, uh, a student event, so we may have students that are on today or even some of the faculty from Chesapeake College who has joined the discussion that may ask questions. And if not, we will go with the questions that we sent out to our panelists. So Gwen, it looks like you're trying to say something, but we can't hear you. Okay. So I guess with no one um, having anything to say, the first question is of course our, our icebreaker. For the sake of our students, as well as for those that are just wanting to get to know our panelists, we wanna know where are some of your favorite places to spend time in the communities that you serve? And I guess we will continue with our list and we'll go backwards and we will start with uh, Councilman Tolliver. My favorite place, you know, it's, it's, that's a tough one because I'm also a pastor, so I don't have a whole lot of time. I'm gonna tell you my favorite place in Chestertown to go is Washington College Library or the Kent County Public Library. I love being in the library. I love being around the books. I like the quiet, the quiet, I, you know, it gives you an opportunity to, to think and, and to have some peace. Um, so that would be that, my favorite place. Down by the water is, is great too, but I like going to the library. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Uh, Councilman Steve Wrightout. 
So Cambridge and Dorchester County have so many places to, uh, great places to visit. Here in the city, we have uh, some wonderful parks. Uh, we have the uh, Harriet Tubman Mural and Museum downtown. Uh, we have a great uh, downtown business community. Um, just so much going on and uh, uh, a great place to be. And we have, of course, uh, the Cambridge Center for Chesapeake College here. So uh, lots going on and uh, uh, it's a great place to come visit. All right, Councilwoman Doncella Wilson. Thank you, Shay. Um, one of my favorite places to visit here in the town of Denton is down by the Chop Tank Wharves. Um, we have a new building um, that's down there. It's a space where people can rent out the space. Um, you also have watermen coming in. You're able to see people out on the river boats. Um, there's a marker that's also down by the water that references um, a slave here from Caroline Talbot County who actually, in quick story, he actually was um, looking to, he had got word that he was gonna be sold to the South. And so he had befriended the um, slave owner's dogs. And so when they, when it came time for them to look for him, the dogs didn't bother him because they had, um, he had befriended them. And so I just looked at that as a lesson um, within that, within itself that, um, just making the community a safe place and making the community a place that's friendly um, for all. So that's one of my favorite places, just to be able to go down and connect with the water in that area. Thank you so much for sharing. So I know this conversation is being recorded, so our students know exactly where to find you all at when they are looking for you and can't get you by email. So at this time, uh, Senator Addie Eckert. Thank you very much. I liked be wherever the people are and um, one of my I guess most frequented places is the YMCA. Um, the YMCA is a place to exercise so I spend a lot of time there doing spin, I get a lot of constituent work done there because people can fi find me at five in the morning or seven in the morning or sometimes eight o'clock when we're doing line dancing and we're going to be doing a celebration at the Y with education in Denton this evening, as a matter of fact, but particularly anywhere the people are engaged, um, where I can be in contact and hear what's going on, because I like to be in the middle of the uh, trouble and work to see what we can do to get it resolved. Absolutely. So, Ms. Don Sala Wilson, I'm sure she'll be coming to visit you uh, at the YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that is your resample Hughes. Uh, good, good morning again. Um, so in Dorchester County, mine is right by the water it's around Sailwinds. I find myself uh, when I cross the Chop Tank Bridge, uh, making sure I am right there by the water because I just find it to be tranquil and an opportunity to um, re-engage and just really let my hair down, literally. Um, and in Wicomico County, you may think this is different, but this is me. Um, I find it on West Road in Green Acres Cemetery. You're probably saying, why a cemetery? Um, again, it goes back to peace. And I can find myself and mentally have a conversation with myself, but also my father's buried there. Um, and I just find that I'm there quite often um, just, to, just to have peace. But it sits right in the heart of my district. I can walk to it. And that's just me. And um, so th those are my places. Awesome. Uh, Delegate Johnny Maltz, I'm not sure if you heard the question, but we're actually doing the icebreaker. Where can constituents find you hanging out and your favorite place to spend time in the community you serve? Can, can everybody hear me okay now? Yes. Hot. Wow. <laughs> well, um, thank you. It's great to be with you. Um, I apologize for the problem earlier. I, my favorite place to be where I'm most comfortable is out on the street uh, or in the businesses or in the community. I just, I like, I, I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to spend time with other people, listening to them and learning from them and talking to them. And um, that has been, um, I'm most comfortable there. I find it to be the most beneficial um, and also, uniquely probably the most productive and um and I, I probably spend too much time there but but that's that's where I you'll find me and that's where I like to be so thank you yeah. glad you can hear me yes absolutely um so now to Brittany and Gwen I'm sure after 4 30 when you leave the board of elections I'm not sure if you want 
constituents finding you <laughs> after work. But let's talk about it. Brittany, where's your favorite place to hang out at? Um, I really enjoy the downtown area of Cambridge, local restaurants, good ice cream, cute shops. So I do enjoy being down there, but I find it hard to have time to go out because I have a toddler at home. So for activities that I can take her to, especially in these weird times right now, I like to go to um, the National Blackwater Wildlife Refuge and we walk, ride bikes, bird watch, and she really enjoys doing that. Awesome. Uh, Gwen? Okay, I'm going to pop on her. Sorry. Okay, so I like to go to the Jerry Bowl Park at Great Marsh, and I like to walk there and then walk around the pseudo track that's there, and I try to get like a mile to a mile and a half walk, and um, I also like to eat crabs there at that park, so that's, that's where I like to hang out. I'll be sure to meet you there on Saturday, Gwen. Thank you so okay. much. <laughs> so I am just so excited. Thank you all for sharing. I mean, as you as you all have shared, I mean, you share not only places that you enjoy hanging out at, but some amazing places for communities to also explore, um, to also find their peace. Um, we do have a question from someone that is on with us today and we're waiting for that one. So while we are waiting for that one, the first question that we're going to discuss is, what is your focus of your elected office? And how does your elected office serve your community? So we'll go backwards. Of course, I know uh, Gwen and Brittany are not elected officials. However, if you either one of you wanna um, kind of talk to what you do as it relates to um, serving our elected officials or getting them registered, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, so we, um, we work all year long preparing for an election. Um, we spend time registering people. We get tons of registrations every day, lots of phone calls and questions. We are training our election judges and just trying to make sure that we are as prepared as we possibly can be for all situations on election day and during early voting. So we spend all of our time just gearing up and getting ready. Absolutely. So of course, um, our Board of Elections is where our candidates would go to essentially file their candidacy to run for the elected office. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, Senator Johnny Moss. Delegate Johnny Moss. Oh uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. I've messed. I've done something to my Zoom, so I can't see myself on the screen. But um, you know, our priority for our office, the number one priority, and you know, you hear about this, you see all these issues in the news, the headlines, and things like that. But uh, you know, our number one priority is constituent service, and that's that's addressing the needs of of everyone uh, that you've been. Um, honored to, to represent. Um, uh, and then a secondary, uh, a secondary issue, but it's also a priority, um, is to work to protect um, your district, your, your, uh, your citizens, so they can live and enjoy the, uh, the lives that they're accustomed to, and to try to protect that to make sure they have a solid foundation to be able to um, not only survive, but to succeed into the future. Thank you so much. Um, Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes. Sure. So I believe, and um, I, I very much um, believe that each one of our constituents should be aware of what resources are available to them in the community. And I found that, you know, throughout uh, my public service career, and even prior to that, that I had a strong suit in being able to connect those people to resources. And so in doing so, I've always made it a point to make sure that people are aware of uh, public works department, what they can um, resolve from there, whether it's trash pickup, whether it is a water sewer issue, that they understand what those are. And so when I made that a point um, while running for office and serving in the capacity, 
I would have district meetings in the community so they could ask questions, so they would understand what was going on in the local county government and now certainly at the state level. And so I believe that is my goal and that's my role. Um, we've had issues now when we're in this COVID pandemic situation um, from unemployment issues on a daily basis to where they can get their protective gear, um, nursing home issues. And so if I can do something each and every day towards making someone else's life better, connecting them to resources, and I think that's my purpose and my role in this capacity of serving as an elected official. Thank you so much. Senator Addie Eckerts. Thank you very much. You've heard two great ones from our delegates, constituent service and connecting people to resources. And definitely we all do that. In addition to that, I see myself as kind of an interface between the people and the government. So I sit on the budget and tax committee. And it's really important to me that the policy that we set um, as it gets translated down into what I call the front lines, that's um, down where the people are, <coughs> excuse me, that it fits. So as a member of the budget committee, I oversee the Department of Health, Behavioral Health, the Opiate Command Team, Children's Services, Education, Human Resources. And as you know, all of that's been very, very important as we've gone through this whole COVID experience. So connecting people, making sure what we put in place actually works. If it doesn't, let's see if we can fix it or determine the barrier. Excuse me. <coughs> Did you have anything else you wanted to add? I'm good. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, <coughs> Ansela Wilson. Thank you, Shay. Um, much like um, Delegate Cherie Sample Hughes, that I find myself to filling people with resource information, um, feeling like the town office should be a hub for the community, that if you don't have answers, the town office is where you should be able to call and check those resources. And if there's something that we don't know, then we are charged with finding those answers um, for our citizens. I find myself <coughs> answering questions um, along the sides of communications with other elected officials, communications with our local police department. And so I've been able to host several um, community conversations. And so that way, um, citizens know who their elected officials are by face, by name, and then also <laughs> knowing that our elected officials and um, our town employees are approachable and that you're, are, that you're able to have those conversations with them. Absolutely. Uh, Councilman Steve Rideout. Uh, Cambridge has a, a city manager form of government uh, with elected officials so that a, a lot of the administrative uh, work management of the employees is done by the city manager. Uh, my uh, particular issue as a member of city council, uh, actually there are several. I mean, obviously we do the legislation, um, pass ordinances, resolutions, uh, look at what the budget is uh, or being proposed and approve that, set the tax rate for uh, the, the citizens of Cambridge in regard to real estate. When I went on the uh, city council, one of the, one of my uh, first issues was uh, making our, our uh, city government more transparent. Um, and so as a result, I write a, uh, an article after every city council meeting called Cambridge Matters, which details what happened at our city council meeting. And occasionally I'll do some writing about other things that are going on in the community so that the community has a better idea of what's going on and, and why it's going on. Uh, additionally, certainly as the other uh, delegates and state senators and, and uh, city representatives, I too am a, a person that uh, does a lot of constituent work, answering questions uh, from uh, local citizens, referring them to the, the person to um, uh, have an answer, uh, you know, who might have an answer. Or just this morning, I, uh, I had the answer for a question from somebody about what what the law is because of my background as a juvenile court judge out of Virginia uh, and a lawyer I have experience so I can uh, sort of educate people on things rather than sending it off to the city attorney or to the city administrator to do so I'll do I won't give legal advice but I'll give information about 
where they can look for uh, uh, the answer to a question that they have. Um, some of the, uh, one of the real areas of importance here for me is uh, our code enforcement and housing issues. Uh, we really, uh, over the years, have not done a very good job for our citizens in that regard. And, and so I've been trying to help uh, get us to do a better job for them. So that's, uh, that's a quick summary of what I do. All right, thank you, Councilman Wright, um, Steve Wrightout. At this time, Mr. Tolliver. Um, you know, uh, the, the response that uh, Delegate Donnie gave to me was the most relevant one for my area. The third ward in Chestertown is the most diverse ward. Um, and Chestertown is a place where it puts a lot of emphasis on its historic nature, but it neglects this, this pocket of, of area that has high poverty on one end or potential for high poverty on one end, and on the other end of it, it has extremely expensive homes. What we try to do in the third ward is to, is to shed light that that part of town is, is exciting, that there's businesses that, that people can come to the shop and, and get things done, and that there are people that live there that, that can contribute to the society of, of Chestertown. It's not all about downtown. It's not all about the waterfront, but that the third ward has some exciting things going on. And we try to shed, you know, we try to shed light on that. That's, that's why I'm, I'm really big on this thing about it being the hotbed of activity. On one day, you might have um, some basketball things going on. On another day, it might be um, some, major, some major shopping going on. But it, it gets, that area, part of, that part of town gets neglected. And I feel like it's my job to, to, to raise its profile. Thank you so much for sharing. I mean, all of those answers were uh, great answers in terms of just uh, having our students to really understand what it means to be an elected official and what the focus area is um, as it relates to our elected officials. So of course, we have a question that came in the chat from one of our students. Does anyone know when stimulus talks will begin again in Washington. I know many of your state and local leaders and don't really work in DC, but I'm curious if anyone has heard anything. So um, I don't know if someone wants to speak on this. I, I, I like to jump, I'm sorry, go ahead, whoever that was. But I, I no, wanna jump in on that. And for whoever that person asked that question, I, I advise them, and this is, actually I got, a, I got it on right now, but, but learn to watch the financial network, in particular, Bloomberg TV, because mm -hmm. it, it gives you light and information on all the things that are going on worldwide in terms of finance, in particular, how, thing, how finances are being managed in the, in the federal government. It'll talk a lot about the Federal Reserve Bank. It'll talk a lot about stimulus impact and when these things are gonna happen. Now, how does that answer the question? Um, if you're following Bloomberg, it'll tell you that there's there's some delays. It'll tell you what's the nature of the, the delays. Um, I would recommend starting to follow follow that to get some really um, really good and, and sound information um, on on government finance. Yeah, yeah I think that's an uh, excellent suggestion. Um, certainly, that would give a um, synopsis as to what's going on and it would very, be very vital to um, understanding where they are in their process because at the federal level, so many things change so quickly. Yes. Um, it's very difficult to keep up with what's going on, but nevertheless, it certainly would give you that insight. What I would say on the state government side of things, because the state and the federal all tie in together to a certain extent. If you recall when the president made an executive order um, on the stimulus funds, meaning that um, the unemployment in particular, where he indicated that, you know, there'll be $400 um, and then, but the states had to make up a 25% difference, which is like $100. We had to, at the state level, figure out where was that going to come from and we had to process to ensure that as a state, that we would at least make sure our citizens would be entitled to the 300 in addition to figuring out how we make that happen um, for the state's responsibility. So um, I certainly employ you to look at you know, what's going at the federal level, but then also be aware that at the state level, we are still charged with the same responsibilities um, 
to a certain extent, maybe not at that same greater height or the amount, but it's still where we're still responsible for ensuring that those things all come together and the funds are there as well for the citizens. Does anyone else want to chime in on that? It's good. It's good. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes and Councilman Tolliver for those uh, suggestions as well as those responses. Um, so if we don't have any other questions in the chat, I actually want to go to question three that was emailed out. What issues on the ballot are directly facing members of your community the most? Um, and then, of course, the follow-up to that question is, what will you do to assist members in the community you serve to understand those issues? So I guess we will go from, of course, bottom to top again, and we'll start with Councilman, Councilman Tolliver. I'm, I'm, I will be the first to admit to you that I'm not well-versed on the state-level issues that are going to affect Chestertown beyond the fact that, I, I, well, let me put it this way. What, what I'm preparing myself for, and, and hopefully what the other council members are preparing for, is the coming, the coming budget cycle of 2021, because that's when the COVID numbers are going to really show effect um, in terms of the revenue that we will have to set our local budgets. So I guess what I'm doing now is trying to prepare myself for that. Um, there's always some sort of environmental issue as well that, that affects Chestertown and all of us for that matter, since um, the water is such a, a vital part of our communities. So I'm, I'm, I take a look at, at, at environmental issues. Um, one of the things that, that's a big issue for us right now is uh, the cleanup of an oil spill that happened at, at the local hospital many, many years ago and how um, the hospital wants to shut down um, the work uh, to stop cleaning it up. So that's, that's a major issue. And what, we, what I'm gonna be focusing on over the next several months is educating people on the need to keep those filtration pumps going and what the citizens can do to encourage the hospital um, directors that, uh, that there might be a major environmental impact on the lives of the citizens um, of Chestertown. So those are the things that I'm focusing on and, and, and we'll be working on um, to educate those in, in, in my neighborhood. Okay, so um, what if instead of us going down the list, what if those that desire to speak to those questions kind of just uh, jump in to share their insight for the sake of time? Okay, Senator Addie Eckert. Thank you very much. There is a budget question on the ballot this year, and this has been debated in Annapolis for a number of years. And Maryland has a balanced budget system, and we have the most um, highly executive budget. That means the governor sets that budget. The legislature can only reduce items. They can't add to the budget. And the ballot question would allow the General Assembly to add to that budget as long as it stays with the amount that the governor has established in the budget. It also provides a means for vetoing it on the part of the governor and then a means for overriding that veto. Now, years ago, the reason we have a strong executive budget was because when the General Assembly took control of that budget, uh, they bankrupted the state. So that's why the change was made to the executive budget, and it's operated that way until this time. What this amendment, though, would do, the ballot question would do, is to allow some bit of back and forth, I believe, with the General Assembly and with the executive budget, as long as it doesn't exceed an established bottom line, if you will. So I think it's important that folks get information about that and talk about that. I think there will be forums coming up and information put out in the voter women's voters guide. And that's important to research all that you can to be informed on that ballot question. Thank you. Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes. Sure. So in addition to the budget question that's on the ballot, uh, we also have sports betting 
question as well. And with that being on the ballot, um, from the standpoint as a revenue source, I certainly, you know, you have to make your own decisions on what you think is best for you when it comes to gambling and sports betting and things of that nature. That's certainly a personal decision. What I will say is this, um, when we had the casino bill, or excuse me, the casino question on the ballot some time ago, um, and safeguarding some of the funds that so we could pay for education and many other things, those funds generally and always are earmarked for specific things. Um, case in point, the casino revenue, uh, where the citizens of Maryland agreed that it's okay to do, was to earmark the funds for education. And you, everyone's probably familiar with and heard Kerwin and Blueprint for Maryland, um, which is our large <laughs> way of saying that we want to make sure we have revenues for education and this is going to address um, not only the K through 12, but um, really putting an emphasis on mental health and things of that nature. But the point is, is that those revenues will be earmarked directly for education, as well as um, historically black colleges and universities. That's those, some of the things that we wanted to earmark those things for. But what has happened through this pandemic is that um, the casinos were closed. We had no revenue coming in at that time. We also had challenges and still with uh, the gasoline tax um, where those funds again were earmarked to pay and offset some things for education, um, but no one was traveling during the pandemic. So those things we keep in mind as we think about ballot questions overall is that we have a purpose for those funds and where they would go to help offset our expenses in the state of Maryland. Um, and so, you know, you have to make some of those decisions, uh, a mindset of where it goes, what is it supposed to do, how will we as a citizenry benefit from it. Um, so, you know, addition to the budget question about the governor, whether or not we can add or subtract from his uh, uh, budget, as well as the sports betting, those are the two that you'll see. And you really certainly have to, I believe, it's important to educate yourself on those. Um, I know that I'll be doing several forums for various groups in the community um, to just go in a little bit deeper into uh, what that looks like. Anyone else want to chime in with this? Well, I appreciate um, Senator Addy and Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes, um, as well as uh, uh, Councilman Tolliver for your input. And I, I do believe that in order for constituents to uh, make an informed decision about what they're voting for, we must be educated on what we're voting for. It's easy to just go down and check something, but the long-term effect that it will have on the communities as a whole, it, it has to be considered. So thank you um, both for sharing, or you three for sharing that. So how can a student um, or a community member register to vote? And I think we'll actually start with Ms. Brittany Phillips from the Dorchester County Board of Elections. You're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So. We have a lot of options for people to register to vote. Um, the biggest one, we probably get most of our registrations from online registrations. Right now, especially, you're gonna see a lot of links on social media and things like that where you can click a button and it takes you to the proper website to get registered and then that information is forwarded to us for processing within the next you know, business day or so. Um, so that's huge, online registration. Um, they can do that on our state website as well if someone wants to go directly to that, which is elections with an S, elections.maryland.gov slash voter services. Um, you can register there. You can request um, a mail-in ballot there. You can check your voter status there. Um, so there's a lot of resources on that site. Um, another way that people can register is um, in person. They can always come to our office. Um, and fill out a form. They can print one out from online and mail it to us. And there is also such a thing called universal registration where um, most state agencies, if you go to the NBA or something like that, unless you opt out and say, no, thank you, I don't wanna be a registered voter, they're gonna go ahead and send us your information. We're gonna process it. That way you're on the rolls. And when you show up to vote, there's not gonna be any confusion about if you're registered or not, you're gonna be in our system. Thank you so much, Brittany. I do um, actually want you to speak to the process um, of actually taking the course 
Um, I know that was something that I had actually completed a uh, previous election year when I ran for county council to engage the college community and the students in the college community um, in terms of being advocates to get other students registered to vote. And that would be something amazing. I believe that Chesapeake College can benefit from both here in Dorchester County and in Y Mills for both campuses to actually have advocates that would be on the campus website when we do go back in person to be able to provide assistance with um, registering someone to vote. So if you could speak to what that is called in that process, that would be awesome. Sure, yes, so we do have a voter registration volunteer program, VRV as we call it, um, and people come to us to get trained and so that way they know um, everything that someone needs to have in order to be an active registered voter. And we, we go through this whole booklet that goes through some voter registration laws and regulations and it really um, gives that volunteer the information they need so that they can answer questions when they're out doing a registration drive or when they run into a friend at school or whatever it is. Um, and most of them, you know, keep a stash of the applications with them so they can hand them out when there's questions and things like that. They get a card that shows um, that they've been trained and they're certified to help people with registering. And then either the voter can bring the information to us or the volunteer, you know, they'll bring the applications back for processing at that point. But it's just a good opportunity for people to be aware of how to register and all the steps that go through it. And it's a pretty simple process. So if anyone is interested in becoming a registration volunteer, please call our office, email us, and we will set that up. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, I actually want to go to our panelists, um, specifically in uh, other geographical areas. So Mr. Tolliver, in Kent County, for an individual that were actually interested in registering the vote, um, or they were just interested in understanding the voting process, where would a person or a student that resides in Kent County, where would they go at? Of course, the Board of Elections in Kent County, but uh, they, we have, um, I'm sure they have this up and down the shore, but they have an organization called Your Voice, Your Vote, who actually sends people out to go door to door to canvas neighborhoods. Um, I also think they, they set up stations in, in, the, in the public high school where uh, those that are eligible to, to register can do it before they graduate. And then um, community events and, and, and things that go on around town. There's always a voter registration booth that's there uh, for people just to walk up and um, and, and register to vote. So um, we, we, we go out, the people actually go out in the streets and go door to door, and, and just like the census workers, um, to check to see if anybody needs to register. And Miss, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Doncella, what about in uh, Denton? So in Denton also, our Board of Elections office is located, um, which here in the county we call our health department building. Um, they're on the second floor, so you can always go into our Board of Elections. And then um, I believe it was Brittany, as she stated, that our state agencies also have voter registration forms. Um, you can see me, I have voter registration forms to make sure that people are um, registering to vote and also sharing information with different churches and making sure they have forms available also that if we have members, um, as we know in the rural areas, that if you cannot register online, just making sure we have access um, for everyone to be able to get the forms to register to vote. Thank you so much. And I guess we will go to our next question. Um, I do know that sometimes, especially at Chesapeake College, we have a student government association and some of those individuals that hold positions in our SGA, they are interested in learning more about politics and becoming involved in the voting process or just becoming involved um, with serving or helping out with our elected officials. So I guess for our panelists, what would you, or what suggestions do you have for students that would like to engage in the voting process? And I guess we will start with Councilman Steve Rideau. Um, here in Cambridge, we're we have a, an election coming up in the middle of October for city council. And then we also have uh, the November 3rd elections. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that students can do is uh, 
participate in or listen in on the, uh, 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 the uh, League of Women Voters uh, radio uh, uh, online events uh, mm -hmm. where you'll learn about the different uh, candidates and what their positions are. Uh, there's articles in the newspaper about them as to, uh, in regard to the local election and what they're running for, what their history is. So this would be, a, I think, a very important way to, to learn more about uh, who's running, what their positions are, uh, because it's, uh, as we we're talking about, voting here is really critical. I mean, we're a, we're a democracy, we're a free people, but if we don't participate in the voting process, uh, we're undercutting that uh, and we're maybe getting people who aren't as good as they could, you know, should be uh, to represent us in our districts, in our wards, uh, in our states. So uh, getting informed, uh, learning about the candidates, learning about their positions is absolutely critical. And this is just a couple ways to, that you can do it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Delegate uh, Johnny Moss. So this is, this is one of my favorites um, when people talk about elections and how they get involved. And this, this year is, is going to be, everything is, is, you know, inside out. We're doing things, everything differently. And um, so the, uh, usually we'll have precincts. I mean, every, everything we've done in the past with elections seems like it's, it's changing. And when we used to do it in the past, it was still confusing. And so uh, this, this year in particular, um, if you could volunteer to help with the elections in any form or capacity, I think by giving your time and helping the Board of Elections to organize, because even if they're going to simplify and try to reduce uh, the number of precincts and things like that, I think uh, they're going to need more help than they can imagine. And there's going to be a lot of confusion. And by being involved in the process, you inherently will learn more about the candidates and the issues and the things that are going on. It's a great way, especially at your college and your college years when you have all those commitments in life. I'm being sarcastic. Hopefully you've got some free time to give. And uh, it's a great way you understand all the time. Holding an election is an in incredibly labor intensive process. And this is going to be all new because there's going to be a lot of mail-in ballots this year. So they the board of the boards of elections they're guesstimating kind of what they're going to be dealing with but nobody really knows and i think the more resources that the board of elections have on hand and the sooner they can get those resources and try to train people because it's not like you can just walk in the door and work in a polling place or work in a board of elections there's a lot that goes into that um if you would spend time this year this election cycle it would benefit the system. I, I'm also concerned that we're gonna lose some of our volunteers because of the changes. There are creatures of habit and every year they do an election. Well, they're upset now because the elections are changing. And so they may not come back and that's uh, no time. We don't need that right now. What we need is we need to make sure we've got the resources available to conduct a, a, an efficient and effective and, and solid um, election. The way we do our elections is is, is unique. We do it differently than probably any else in the, anywhere else in the world. And, and every state has a different regime and counties even have different regimes. But, you know, if you and uh, your friends, your peers, relatives, anybody that can contribute and offer their assistance, they'll not only learn about the candidates and the issues, but they'll also be giving back to helping uh, protect the system. Thank you so much, uh, Delegate Johnny Moss. Uh, Delegate Sheree Semple Hughes. So I just really, um, number one, encourage all of our college students to get involved, get involved in the process early on, whether it is starting from just listening to your news of what locally is going on in this arena, um, what is happening in your community by way of attending, whether it's your Democratic or your uh, Republican 
Central Committee meetings. Um, so you can get that nexus of information and really feel engaged because it is a lot of energy around this election. Um, and we want to be able to ensure that everybody is a part of the process. The one thing that I always direct people to do if they're really early on getting involved and, and, and wanting to be a part of the election process and is to go to the Board of Elections frequently asked questions. Because what you'll find really very quickly are a lot of the questions that you may have um, are answered right there. Because with this system that we're you know, working with this go around, um, it's a lot of information. And it is from you know, voting in person to the hybrid options, to getting a ballot or question um, that you can have sent to you in the mail. Um, so there's a whole lot that's going on right now. So it's important for you first to be equipped with the accurate information. And if you have additional questions, certainly feel free to contact the Board of Elections for that specific information. You don't want to do anything that is wrong in the sense of, um, you know, trying to assist somebody with an, uh, um, an application to vote and you not be able to have all the information that they may need in order to complete it properly. For instance, I think even the Board of Elections can correct me if I'm wrong. I think you might, it's important for you to have uh, either a blue ink pen or a black ink pen. Um, you know, so there's just really just important things that you need to know and making sure everything is filled out and completed properly. And then also the last piece I'll mention is that in the state legislature, we passed laws recently that allows persons who have been incarcerated to now vote. Um, so those things are important because what I found many a times when I was out on the campaign trail, I would go to the barbershops, the beauty shops, and I would hear from citizens. They say, oh, I, I like you as a candidate. I know you do a great job, but I can't vote for you. Mm -hmm. Well, I asked the question, why can't you vote for me? And then they say, you know, I've been incarcerated. I can't vote. I was like, wait, no. In two, I believe it's 2016. We passed legislation that you can mm -hmm. And there are certain um, areas where there may be some challenges as far as what you can and cannot do if you have a felony. But you still need to make that effort. Contact the Board of Elections and ask those specific questions and really be able to be educated for your own self. Thank you. Um, Delegate, uh, no, Don Teller Wilson. And again, and not really just to repeat um, what the others have stated, as they've stated many um, great options and opportunities. But again, just encouraging students um, that their voice definitely has power and to um, be involved and engage in the voting process. Um, and we have the election folks on if there's election judge opportunities, if there's other groups to volunteer with, um, such as Councilman Els Tolliver talks about your vote, your voice. So finding those groups um, that are engaged in this process and joining in with them, your local NAACP chapters, your Lions clubs, um, those social clubs that um, have that information as well. So I would just say to just stay involved in the process and involved with groups that are out here um, having information out in our communities around voting. So I guess, um, Brittany, did you want to add anything in terms of um, engaging in the voting process, volunteer opportunities, specifically this election term? Yeah, I can touch on that. Um, it has been mentioned a lot about serving as an election judge, which is huge, and it's a really great way to learn our process and how Maryland conducts elections. I know there's a lot of um, interesting and sometimes intimidating news out there. People think things are going to happen with their ballot and this and that, and if you're a judge, you're really well informed on our process and how we keep things safe and secure. Um, so it's great for especially a young voter to get in and learn for themselves hands on how this election is handled and how we count everything and, you know, process things and run things in a polling place on election day. Um, so that is a huge way to stay connected. Plus you build relationships with your local staff and other judges. So it's just a great resource where you feel more comfortable maybe calling the election office because we know you on a more personal level and you can call and ask questions and, you know, you kind of just feel a little more connected that way. So expanding the network is definitely something that I always talk about. You know, you don't have to be an expert at everything, but when you're in the correct networks and people have the expert knowledge, you know exactly who to go to to get the information from. We do have a question that came in the chat. Um, are the funds received under the sports betting being proposed um, in, in mark for a specific use? 
Does anyone sure. know? I can answer that. Um, so it was, and Senator Eckhart, if she may correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think it was Senate Bill 4 that allowed us to then move it to referendum because there was a bill the prior year that was introduced to discuss sports betting in and of itself. And within that, um, I believe it was where it was indicated that it would be for education. So the majority of the funds would be for education. One of the things I did just want to highlight was that on that same subject, um, our neighboring states, they have the sports betting. And one in particular, um, New Jersey, I think they realized um, about 400 billion dollars in funds from having that ability to have sports betting. Um, and with that being said, I want to say there is a specifically earmark for education as well, or the majority of it. Certainly can't speak for their state, but um, like I said earlier, with our casinos, you know, we look to that being earmarked and streamlined directly to education and the same for this. Thank you so much. So I guess we are down to our last few minutes. Um, the last question I do want to ask as we wrap up, are there opportunities for student internship with elected um, officials or the Board of Elections? And if so, how can students find information? So I guess we will start with Senator Addie Eckert. Thank you very much. And one of the things I was going to say how to get involved, I got involved through the Nurses Association because I was concerned about health care. And I followed it for a while. And then I went and found an elected official who also was a nurse to learn about how to get involved. So I think for all of our students, find out what you're passionate about, get to know your elected officials, that's one way. And I have, in fact, the folks in my office all have been students who came to me either on a voluntary internship or a paid stipend internship or as a paid or as a member that tracked with us as an intern through the Maryland General Assembly. And they then settled out because they were interested in government to work in my office. So you can work, you can just call your legislator and find out what's available, and they would be able to direct you to the right places to be able to get engaged. So come talk to us. We love to sh have people shadow with us and get to know what we're all about. Uh, anyone else want to add to what uh, Senator Addy Edwards has said? Hey, I'll, I'll add. I, uh, earlier in my four-year term, I tried to engage our school system in uh, having students do an internship uh, with the members of city council, and I could never get it going. But uh, That's a good certainly one. if there's a college student who had a project that he or she wanted to work on uh, that I could work with them on as part of an internship. Happy to do that. Um, my idea was that we would get students to, to have an issue in their community, in their neighborhood, uh, do the research, help mm -hmm. them with the research, come and make a presentation to city council about it. Uh, and then maybe out of that, either give some direction to the city manager or pass an ordinance that would try to impact whatever that issue is. So other local uh, city council, county council representatives, they might want to take that idea in their community idea. and see if you could get it going. But I just wasn't able to get it going here. Thank you. And, and Shay, um, it's Don so and I would just add, um, that currently we've worked with interns before. The town of Denton is not opposed to having interns. Um, I work full time for county government. And so I do have two interns currently, one from Salisbury University and one from the University of Denver. And we've also had other interns um, from Washington College. But what part of their orientation into um, those internships is to attend our commissioners meetings, our local council meetings, and then um, being able to discuss how social workers play a role in what's going on in those meetings. So definitely um, would encourage um, students to look for internships within mm -hmm. county government and local government. Thank you. Uh, Delegate John Moss has something. Okay. Yeah, and for, for a lot of the uh, students who are listening, um, many of the positions in government uh, there really isn't a training manual or um, a class that will necessarily prepare you for that position. 
uh, the best way to learn in a lot of instances is to actually be there and learn hands on. And that's why internships are so important and they're so helpful. Um, the internships are not necessarily all that challenging. Some of them, I know I started interning and my first job while I was in law school was simply answering phones in an office or filing papers in an office. And it seemed to me at the time, you know, like I wasn't performing anything special, but in reality, I was learning an awful lot just by being there. So uh, the, the, the ability to get, if you can find an internship, by all means, uh, there's nothing but a benefit for you to, uh, to be able to do that. So I, I, I highly encourage uh, anyone that can intern to try to intern. Thank you, uh, Johnny Moss. I wanna add in to that as well. Um, they are so invaluable because you can uh, really first identify whether or not you have this strong interest or not. Mm -hmm. Um, through an internship. I know that when I had my very first internship, it was in actually in high school with uh, Lewis and Watson Funeral Home. So early on when I mentioned about the cemetery, it's not just because, you know, I find it peace and tranquil, but my passion is within the business and being in that, that sector. But what I wanted to reiterate was that it was through that internship that I was able to garner so much information, the understanding of the business um, and the compassion that comes with it. And so the do's and the don'ts and things of that nature. So I cannot um, reiterate enough how invaluable you can find an internship. With that being said, in the Maryland General Assembly, I've had an intern um, at Wells Fargo University. Uh, she has since graduated. And I also had one from American University that worked with me in my district office. And she has since graduated. Now she's in law school in New York. But what they both um, specifically had said that they would not have ever had exposure at that level to other elected officials being within that, that space um, and the policy process on what we go through to just get a bill passed. <laughs> um, so to that, I think that you certainly should reach out to your legislator and see if there's an opportunity for you. Now, as we move into the 2021 session, it's gonna look a lot different. While we had normally our interns walk the halls and shadowing us, you may be on this very same tool, the internet, and shadowing us because we're not going to have interns specifically um, in the halls with us to keep everyone safe as we travel through this COVID uh, pandemic. So still reach out, make sure you have an internship, and you can do that through um, by being here, right here on the, on the internet with us as we're doing in Zoom today. So opportunities are there, and you should take those opportunities. Thank you so much, Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes. So um, I want to actually go ahead and give Brittany an opportunity. Are there internship opportunities at the local Board of Elections? So we don't currently offer specific internships. Um, like I said earlier, a good way to be involved is being a registration volunteer or an election judge, which is actually a paid position. You do get paid for your training and for working on election day or during early voting. Um, and then again, not an internship, but most local election boards hire temporary staff during like an election season, about 10 or 12 weeks surrounding an election before and after. Um, and it is a paid position and you learn a lot. You learn a lot of the ins and outs of the election board um, and how the election is run. So that's usually um, just a temporary position or some are called a county tech, county technician. Um, and those are usually available at most local boards in Maryland. Thank you so much. I wanna say thank you all. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for all of the insight and the expert knowledge you have shared with us today. Um, at this time, I'm actually going to uh, give Mr. Mark Berry, the Director of Student Engagement and Development, the opportunity to speak as well as we'll hear from Ms., uh, Dr. Coppersmith if he has any closing remarks as well. Thank you so much, Shay, and thank you to you for um, taking on the task, Shay, and hosting. You did an amazing job. Um, and most certainly, thank you to all the panelists for taking the time out of your busy, busy days to um, come and educate our students. This is a critical year um, for, for voting, and it's really important to encourage our students to vote. And I think you guys did just that today. So I'm really thankful and I'm appreciative. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Shay. All right, Dr. Coppersmith. Just real quick, just another thank you for our local leaders, both town and county and uh, regional. 
for their work with us today. We have uh, invited our students to participate through email uh, messages. And I do believe that many members of our student government have agreed to volunteer uh, at the polls for this coming election. Uh, so those students have taken advantage of that opportunity. Uh, just uh, like all of you hoping for the best in November, it's uh, really a critical thing for us. Our country's facing so many challenges, but I am very appreciative of the leadership we have in our local region on the Eastern Shore for all of these, uh, these, these things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Copperson. So with that being said, I want to say again to all of our panelists, uh, Mark Berry, Dr. Copper Smith, thank you all for the opportunity to moderate this discussion. Thank you for our panelists for agreeing to actually come on today to share your knowledge. This was definitely well. I believe that it's going to take many conversations as well as partnership to engage a community so that they are informed in not just the voting process to show up and turn out on the day of election, but also to provide support to you as our elected officials, even after the election. So if no one else has anything to say, we, okay. Sorry, I just wanted to share some important dates and deadlines with you guys for the yes, presidential agenda. So um, just so everyone knows, uh, the panelists and anyone listening and students that are watching, um, let me see. So October 13th at 5 p.m. is the deadline to register to vote or make any changes to your registration. You can do that online. You can drop things off in our office, um, have it mailed in. It does need to be received by our office on October 13th for it to be processed timely for the election. Um, October 20th is the deadline to request if you would like to receive your ballot by mail or web delivery and then would mail it back to us. Um, again, that's October 20th to request a mail-in ballot. Um, and then if you're choosing to vote in person, um, statewide, the dates for early voting are October 26th through November 2nd, and that includes the weekend, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., all eight days straight. So plenty of opportunity there. And then on election day is November 3rd, and polling places or vote centers should be open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. as well. Thank you so much. We definitely need those dates, uh, of course. They keep us structured and keep us in line. So if no one else has anything <laughs> else to say, I truly appreciate it and uh, hope that you all have an amazing rest of your Monday. Thank you. Me too. Thank, Thank you, Shay. You're Thanks, welcome. Shay. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Great job.